There are plenty of great reasons to support your local craft brewery. They might make really awesome beer, or they might create dozens of local jobs, or they might just have a cool space to grab a seat and knock down a few pints. I see there are a lot of passionate drinkers online posting various articles and blog entries about why craft beer needs all the support you can give them, or why craft is so much better than big beer, and sometimes even articles calling drinkers downright evil if you ever even thought about buying a Bud Light, because every dollar you give to big beer is like giving a dollar to Hitler. Look. As a guy who has quite a few videos exalting the virtues of independent craft breweries, I'm pretty open to most craft beer arguments, but honestly, there are a lot of bad and poorly thought out and not well researched arguments people try to use to club big brewers like AB InBev over the head with. Whether it's people just seeking clicks because craft beer is popular today, or if they're just taking a stand online and labeling others who don't agree with them as wrong. There are just some really bad articles out there on why you should support craft brewers or should never buy beer from larger corporations. Hey, this is Ryan with Beer by the Numbers, and today we're going to get a little critical and take apart some lazy arguments that craft beer zealots sometimes use. The purpose of this video is not to put people down or to call them dumb but rather to help those that really care about their local craft brewers to talk about their passion in a meaningful way that will actually win hearts and minds. Today I'm going to show you some quotes from an article I found online and I will be linking to it below, but it goes without saying that this is not an invitation to harass or degrade the author. Unfortunately we're at the point online where I have to give this disclaimer. But even though I'm only pulling one example for the purposes of this video, I could link you to a hundred different people I've heard similar arguments from. And before I became someone addicted to beer content, I probably even made similar arguments to those that we're going to look at today. So please, if you want to call anyone dumb or wrong, just go to the comments section below and say it about me. I promise I can take it. Alright, enough of the disclaimers, let's get started. So the author opens their piece trying to establish that beer by craft breweries are inherently better than beer produced by mega brewers. And already this is one of the things that ticks me off most about the pro craft beer crowd a lot of the time. A lot of people make the assumption that because a product tastes better to them, that it must be the better product. If you asked me today if I preferred the taste of something like a craft cream ale or a macro light lager, I would definitely say the craft beer, but if you asked me if the craft beer was a better product, I would tell you I don't know. People buy products because they meet their wants and needs, and whether it's beer or cars or computers, people buy different brands because they have different wants and needs. Guess what beer snobs, sometimes people just want a cheap beer, or maybe a beer they know will be the same wherever they go, or god forbid, maybe they actually enjoy the taste of Coors Light. Budweiser meets the market needs of some drinkers that craft brewers don't. So calling it, quote, a mindless cheap yellow stream to facilitate your elevator trip to old age is just not acknowledging that other people might have different wants or needs than you. And this author also makes the classic fallacy that these macro beers aren't real beer as they say the product is, and I'm quoting again, reduced down to something hardly resembling a beer. Look, independent craft brewers only represent about 14% of the volume share in the United States. I bet if you pulled a large sample of random Americans and asked them to describe a beer, my guess is that you'd end up with a lot of people describing something closer to Bud Light or Coors than any craft IPA with some great hop balance. So if I were to be honest about this sentence, I would say that in the collective mind of the drinking public, craft brews are the ones that resemble the collective consciousness of the light beer ideal rather than the other way around. Sorry I'm taking so much time and focusing on just these first four lines or so of the article, but this author is just projecting a lot of their own preferences and sensibilities onto a huge marketplace made up of millions of people and then, as we're going to see in a minute, wondering why people aren't taking actions in accordance to the preferences they think they should have. 
So moving on, our author tries to give some examples of where craft beer is under attack and how big beer must surely be behind it. They bring up a regulatory challenge that is happening in Florida, where the Florida Retail Federation is challenging a loophole in the law that allows craft breweries to sell beer in their tap rooms without involving a distributor. This allows craft brewers to be more profitable than they otherwise would have been, as well as harms distributors that would otherwise get to sell that beer under the classic three-tiered distribution framework established here in the U.S. after Prohibition. If you want more background on the three-tiered distribution system in the U.S., check the link in the description below for a link to the Beer by the Numbers podcast episode where I cover the topic in depth. The author paints this legal dispute as big corporate beer trying to crush the little guys, but what if I told you that the Retail Federation of Florida includes a lot more businesses than just AB InBev? What if I told you there were local distributors who lose money due to the loophole in the law that they're challenging? What if I told you that beer distributors in Florida have been laying off about 100 workers a year since 2015? What if I told you that locally owned mom and pop bars and liquor stores have fewer options of distributors as they go out of business? What if I told you that only one distributor being able to operate in an area profitably creates local monopolies that drive up the prices of beer? Just because a particular policy favors your small business of preference doesn't mean that the same policy doesn't harm other small and medium sized businesses too. Trying to take the moral high ground here by saying that small business is going to be harmed is just not true when you take a look at the industry as a whole. Sure, AB InBev and other mega brewers stand to benefit if the Florida legislature changes the rules, but a myriad of other small and medium sized businesses would also benefit too. As a guy who has videos on this channel criticizing bad beer laws being debated, I've been guilty of this, but I really try to criticize only those laws that create new and unfair advantages for one side or another. The case given here is that the businesses I like are using a loophole that businesses I don't like want to close. And I wouldn't exactly call that the most compelling argument I've ever heard. All right, I need to keep this moving a little bit, so I'm gonna skip ahead. The author includes a quote from Jim Coke about how Big Beer is buying out craft brewers to disguise themselves to consumers and make money off beer people like buying, which is exactly what craft brewers do. Look, I know a lot of people have a lot of strong feelings about craft beer buyouts, but my personal opinion is if the beer was worth buying before it got bought out, it's probably worth buying after the buyout too. The good news is, is that the author does actually critique craft beer a little bit in this piece, citing studies about how hop-heavy beer may have correlations with certain health problems, or how higher alcohol content in beers can exacerbate other health problems. But they finish this paragraph trying to remind me again that craft beer brings something the, to the marketplace that big beer doesn't. To quote them, Culture, unique craftsmanship, and an independent ethos that doesn't answer to a boardroom. Now, I think these things are actually quite true, but the author ignores what big beer might bring to the table. Things like extreme product consistency and safety, uh, something like universal availability, uh, prices that can't be beat, and beers that millions of people enjoy each and every day. Are those things not important to the beer market? Which set of values are better? And just because we have preferences towards one, should we favor policies that suppress the others? I'm sorry for this really long rant about a single article, but when I make videos talking about how I don't like certain policies or how I wish certain ideas got more play in society, I'm trying to work through the answers to these tough questions so we can get some truth as to how to create a thriving beer marketplace that satisfies everyone. And you might say, Ryan, I think you may have overreacted a little bit here. And you might be right, but I don't think arguing on really simplistic turns that you might like A better than B, therefore everyone needs a lot more of A and a lot less of B, helps us create a friendlier environment. That type of argument just polarizes people, and God knows we don't need any more of that. So if you love craft beer like me, please don't go around calling Bud Light piss water or acting like Miller makes you a bad person. 
I think doing things like that really turned people off who would otherwise be willing to try some great craft brews. Anyway, let me know what you thought of this rant in the comments section below. Feel free to tell me I'm totally wrong, that's the best way for me to learn anyway. And if you want more details on the three-tiered distribution system in the US or the history of the beer can, check the links in the description to the Beer by the Numbers podcast. Once again, this has been Ryan with Beer by the Numbers, and I'll be back next week with more rant-worthy beer content. <laughs>